The footage you are seeing is unedited. The only addition is the voice of Jean-Pierre. According to Huawei, they don't believe that the white man exists. But if they do, that makes me one of the living dead. When I lose my balance, they seem a little reassured. Ghosts don't fall, I guess. At this precise moment, I'm convinced that he's going to let loose his arrow. Maybe he wants to see if it will pass through my body or not. They are both cheerful and frightened at the same time. This one tells the woman to stay back. They look a little more determined this time. I wonder what it means. I feel it's important to show them my peaceful intentions. Michel, my assistant, has kept the remaining porters away from the scene. And Philip, the cameraman, is hiding about 60 feet behind me.
He sees Philippe, who must look like a strange creature, with an eye of a camera instead of a human face. Philippe has been on previous expeditions with me, and he knows these stone axes have deadly weapons. This one, for some reason, is terrified by my black bag. He tastes the salt that I brought as a gift. Danger. His breathing is short. A sign of fear.
after the sword, I show him matches. He burns his hand, as if he can't believe this is real fire. This feels like a meeting in a time war. Perhaps these two Lambi, with their wooden spears and stone axes, are the living ancestors of we, who have learned to fly without wings, talk with the stars, and destroy our own planet. It is not a case of once bitten, twice shy. The bravest warrior wants to know more about the gift of fire sticks from one of the living dead. But he discovers the phosphorus on the matches tastes awful. The gift of instant fire seems to convince the Tulambi that Dutilleux, living dead or not, is socially acceptable, or at least is no immediate threat. With what may be one of the oldest gestures of humankind, the right hand, the weapon hand, is offered in greeting. The Tulambi look at Jean-Pierre's pale skin as if it could be paint. But would the living dead be warm, made of flesh and bone and muscle, just as they are? It seems like the Tulambi have never seen a white man and that they're finally prepared to believe their own eyes. The long, soft hair of the Caucasian is clearly another wonder of the world. This debate leads to a final acceptance of Dutilleux, but the women remain suspicious. Now the Tulambi urge Jean-Pierre to join them on the other side of the river. In the next episode of Tribal Journeys, the Tulambi will confront more modern technology and Jean-Pierre Dutilleux will make an unprecedented trip into the Stone Age. North of Australia and over twice the size of Spain, New Guinea is the tribal world's last frontier. We rejoin Belgian ethnographer Jean-Pierre Dutilleux after his grueling trek through virgin jungle to try and locate what may be 
one of the last Stone Age tribes in the world. The contact took days to establish. The Tulambis first believed white men were living dead, but they finally accepted Dutilleux into their midst. Jean-Pierre now offers the Tulambi their first matches, but they have no idea how to use them. It is a good sign when the women and children are told it is safe to cross over. Hetman Wawe goes back to help them across the bridge that spans the ages. Dutilleux learns the names of the advance party, Sanjuga and Gio. Nandamar. Nagaya. Slowly, cautiously, they explore this alien land on the other side of the river. Following the example of explorers of centuries past, Dutilleux tries to win over the natives with a mirror. They have never seen their own image, except as a trembling reflection in rivers and pools. Is it an evil eye? A trick of the living dead? Either way, it cannot be investigated without due caution.
and then a knife. Stone Age men short-circuiting evolution, leaping in the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, to reach the Age of Steel. The Tulambi remain weary, but decide to accept Jean-Pierre's hospitality. Metal plates, pots and pans are another wonder. Rice is totally unknown. Samjuga inspects it suspiciously. And Gio doesn't like the rice at all. But he changes his mind when I add salt. I'm concerned when Angio begins hitting his head. It turns out to be Tulambi body language for good. When Angio does it, it is a signal for the others to try the rice. Instead of the customary scoop-shaped leaf, Jean-Pierre offers Sanjuga a spoon, but it's the rice that inspires all the head-banging. <laughs> The modern idea that form follows function, that the design of the spoon will dictate its proper use, is obviously not self-evident. They soon forget the spoon and prefer to eat their usual way. My cameraman, Filippo Tiglione, can now get close to individuals without their paying any attention. They have grown accustomed to his face with its cyclop eye of a camera lens, and so pay no attention to him as they investigate the mystery of my camp. The Tulambi language sounds complex. At this point, it's totally incomprehensible. They remain on guard. I am reassured when Angio returns the gift of fire. His way is not quite as fast as a match, but is probably more reliable in the damp rainforest. It certainly makes lighting pipes easy. They seem to consume wild tobacco heavily. 
Nicotine may be the most common narcotic used by primitive societies. The first transatlantic tribes, found by Europeans, said that the white man gave them alcohol, but they got their revenge by giving him tobacco. As the light fades on this extraordinary day, the Tulumbi fade into the forest. At first, Dutilleux fears that they have gone for good, but they camp nearby, where there are wonders yet to see. Next morning, it is Dutilleux's turn to visit the Tulumbi. Despite his research, their culture and language remain unknown. Jean-Pierre has come to the conclusion that the Tulambi are just what they seem to be, the living ancestors of modern man. Yet, to be convinced, he has questions that need answers. They may have not seen matches or rice or plastic cups, but surely they've seen and heard planes fly by. Maybe they believe them to be chariots of the gods. In any case, the Tulambi are clearly part of what Dutilleux calls the fourth world tribes in the depths of the world's rainforests that are so isolated they escape both the benefits as well as the burdens of human progress. As Dutilleux writes in his journal, There are very few groups of human beings still living in the fourth world. Some survive in the Amazon, a few others can be found in New Guinea. When the last ones are contacted and moved from the Stone Age into the modern world, from being free and masters of their own destiny, to being poor and at the lowest level of our Western society, it is a part of ourselves that we vanish forever. In the tribal world, paying attention to your appearance is a survival tool. The Tulambi use bamboo knives to stay well barbered. The man wear a bone from the cassowary bird through the nose, large necklaces of river shells around their necks, and bird of paradise feathers in their hair. They must look their best to attract a mate. These people are hunters and gatherers. They survive by living with the environment, not off of it. The Tulambi return to Tiu's hospitality. And Geo shows how they make arrows and spearheads. Sleep. Then Jean-Pierre gets down to work. As always in this type of situation, he uses a rudimentary show-and-tell session to begin to understand the Tulambi language. How do you call the house? Anger? Anger? Anger. Anger. How, how, how do you call the grass skirt, this? Aiga. 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 And the necklace, the necklace. Nungwa. Necklace. Nungwa. No. Nungwa. Kamka. 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 Kamaka, Aiga, Aiga, Ange, 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 Sa, 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 No, no, no. Ah, Sa, sleep, 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 sleep. Ah, okay, okay. Class over. They take Jean Pierre out into their forest. Their cloaks are made from bark. They serve as raincoats by day and blankets by night. The entire tribe, including the best behaved children that I have ever met, move in uncanny silence for fear of alerting the game. They know the migration trails of animals and the best time of year to find fish, the growing cycle of the palms, bamboo, wild fruits and the roots they rely on. They are always on the move. The rhythm of their lives is that of the jungle.
For hundreds of generations, life for the Tulambi has revolved around their eternal quest for sustenance. It gives them no time to create complex art or a written language, to develop science or conceive profound metaphysical philosophies. Nor has their endless and simplest form of consumerism led to overpopulation, environmental destruction, or the threat of nuclear extermination. They can at least still drink their rivers. But life is short for the Tulambi. They are stalked by diseases like malaria, long conquered by modern medicine. Yes, we can help them, but at what price? If the Tulambi are brought into the modern world, they will suffer the loss of their dignity and traditions to live out their days far below third world poverty levels. Jean-Pierre has lived this dilemma for 25 years. He believes it is inevitable that these last isolated tribes will be found. He also knows that it is better if they are found by people that care enough to fight on their behalf. It is Sunday. The Tulambi have been Dutia's neighbors for three days now. Jean-Pierre offers them food twice a day. He knows that this is the only way he can keep the tribe near his camp. The food means the tribesmen don't have to hunt and gather for themselves, but the expedition supplies are running low. It is time for the Tulambi and the explorers to go back to their respective worlds. It is clear that the Tulambi are no longer frightened by Dutia. They are clearly no longer wary of the expedition, just bewildered and perhaps a little in awe. But they no longer seem to believe the white men are living dead. And Gio seems most eager to continue to communicate with Jean-Pierre, to show them how they live. Uh -uh. Can I see the bag? But I won't. what is it? Can you open? Le petit zoo, il se, il se dit ça comme un toit. Ah, si, 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 si. C'est tout uh -huh. Pour enlever les épines. D'accord. Ok. With Huawei, an ally helping to interpret, Dutiu puts this together. It is Angio's story. We are separate people. We have no contact with the outside world. The first outsider we met was Huawei from the Uya Uya tribe. We came here for medicine that Huawei told us about. We believe in the shaman, but it doesn't always work. We almost died, all of us. We are not strong enough to walk across the big mountains. I'm a human being. I was alone in my mother's belly, not with others like the pigs. My grandfather told me white men did not exist. Now I know they do. I met them. I will return to my forest and die over there. It is the end of my story. Jean-Pierre will later give the tape to linguists. They will hear a language and songs never before heard by modern men. Okay. 
Huawei's original promise to the Tulambi tribe is kept. Dutia administers a concoction of aspirin, vitamin C, and quinine. It can do wonders, but it tastes awful. Assisting these people was the purpose of this expedition in the first place. Allah tries to explain how and when to take the pills to prevent malaria, the main killer in these highlands. We leave enough quinine and vitamins to last the Tulambi for six months. Hopefully, the Papuan government will continue to supply them after our departure. Seka umbanga ti uya uyi. Okay? Nie kunia, kunia. Dutier and his team spent three days with the Tulambi. They must return to their people, and it's time for the members of the expedition to do the same. After the Tulambi had dressed for their journey, they began to sing a farewell song. They lost their drums to their enemies, so they symbolically used their pipes. In his journal, Jean-Pierre Dutilleux writes, You know, it all happened this way, but I still cannot believe what we saw. I must continue my research and I will return to find out whether I was dreaming or not. Minutes later, the bridge across the ages was swept away. 